Well, thank you very much indeed for that very kind introduction. It's very nice to be back here. I haven't been here for five or six years, but um, I know uh, and uh, uh, appreciate Trinity College very much and Dublin as well in general. Um, I'm going to talk about the question of uniqueness, the uniqueness of what the Nazis called the final solution of the Jewish question in Europe, a question they themselves, of course, had largely invented, and uh, which is known now today as, today as the, the Holocaust. Um, so it's probably important to start with talking a little bit about historical uniqueness and comparison. Um, it, it's in some ways kind of non-issue. I mean, history never repeats itself. Same things don't happen in the same way at different times. Every event or set of event, events is unique in some way or another. But of course, history also shows parallels and patterns, and part of the historian's job is to compare events, processes, and structures in the past and try and group them together in uh, larger, under larger headings. Comparison, of course, it's important to realize, does not just mean drawing out similarities, it also means isolating differences and then weighing up the two. And there's an obvious problem, therefore, if we deny any kind of comparability of an event like the Nazi extermination of the Jews in Europe. If it cannot be legitimately compared to any other historical process or event, if it is indeed utterly unique, it cannot be repeated in any form, therefore, and thus the slogan that one often hears, never again, is meaningless. The Holocaust has no relevance to anything else and nothing to teach us in the present day. So positing a categorical uniqueness takes it, in my view, out of history into theology. Uh, and uh, while this is perfectly legitimate for theologians to consider, the historian, I believe, has to approach it in the same way as any other large-scale historical phenomenon, which means asking basic comparative questions and trying to isolate the differences and similarities and, uh, at the level of secular rationality. So that's what I want to do this evening. Let me begin the comparison with the invasion of Poland in September 1939. Very quickly, the conquerors began systematically to suppress the language and culture of the defeated Poles. Polish libraries and cultural institutions were closed. Polish monuments, memorials, and street signs were destroyed. Half a million Poles were arrested and confined in labor camps and prisons where many of them were brutally maltreated and killed. Some 20,000 officers and alleged Polish nationalists were shot up to one and a half million members of the Polish cultural and intellectual elite were arrested. And in 1940, they were taken out of the country in unheated cattle trucks. A third of them did not survive the journey. Now, this human tragedy was a consequence not of the German invasion of Western and Central Poland, but the result of the Soviet conquest of Poland's eastern provinces. The parallels with the policies of Nazi Germany were obvious. From the point of view of the victims, and this, I think, applies right across everything I'm going to say. From the point of view of the victims, it's equally obvious, obvious that it was not always easy to distinguish between the, uh, the two um, mass murders and, and occupations. But still, I'd like to suggest differences there were. The Soviet Union's aim in occupied Poland was to carry out a social revolution along the lines already achieved by Lenin and Stalin in Russia. The eastern part of the country was incorporated into the Soviet system on the basis of a rigged plebiscite. The occupation authorities nationalized the property of the Polish elite, in particular, of course, banking and industrial firms. They broke up the larger landed estates of the Polish nobility and distributed them amongst the mostly non-Polish small peasants. They incited the Ukrainian and Belarusian lower classes who constitute the majority of the population in that area of Poland to stage violent uprisings against the Polish elites. So the Poles were attacked not on racial but on class grounds and a clear parallel to the murderous Red Terror carried out in Russia itself in 1918, immediately after the Bolshevik Revolution. And those whom the Soviets regarded as members of the reactionary bourgeois nationalist elites were deported not away from Soviet territory, but deep into its interior, suggesting that the purpose of the deportation, however brutally it was conducted, was not the complete elimination of a national minority, but its political neutralization, and if possible, indeed, its conversion to communism, goals recognizable in the other 
deportations carried out later in the war by the Soviets as well. And in this sense, the deported groups were not separated from the rest of the Soviet population, but shared its privations and sufferings. In a formal constitutional sense, too, the Soviet conquest of eastern Poland brought with it the introduction of equal political rights for adults, irrespective of their ethnicity. For many Jews, this meant that liberation from the anti-Semitic discrimination practiced by the pre-war regime in Poland of the colonels, the authoritarian regime in the Polands, and this liberation was something that some Jews at least welcomed. Still, there's no doubting <coughs> the murderous nature of the Soviet takeover Eastern Poland. It was, in fact, only one, as I've already suggested, of a number of mass murders and brutal population transfers carried out on Stalin's orders. From September 1941 onwards, the Soviet secret police deported more than 1,200,000 ethnic Germans from the Ukraine, the Volga region, and several Soviet cities to Siberia under notably harsh conditions. 175,000 of them at least did not survive. Half a million members of other ethnic minorities from the Caucasus followed them into Siberian exile. And as the German armies advanced, the Soviet secret police systematically murdered alleged nationalists and counter-revolutionaries locked up in Soviet prisons that lay in the path of the Wehrmacht. 100,000 prisoners were shot, bayoneted to death, or blown up with hand grenades in prisons in the western Ukraine alone. All of this is done in the name of Soviet military security. The suspicious Stalin considered all these people a security threat behind the uh, Soviet front lines as the Germans advanced. So for all the violence meted out to the unfortunate deportees, and no one should underestimate its extent, its brutality, this is not an attempt to exterminate an entire people. In one case, however, it's been argued that Stalin did indeed carry out a genocidal program of mass murder, deliberately targeting an ethnic group. This is the case of the Ukrainian famine of the early 1930s, which some Ukrainian groups now want to be given equal status with the Holocaust. In 2006, the Ukrainian parliament actually passed a law making it illegal to deny that the Ukrainian famine was a genocide. Ukrainian immigrant associations in the USA and Canada now use the term holodomor, meaning murder by famine. And it has a certain uh, uh, resonance, the, the word holocaust, of course. And a holodomor remembrance day is held every year in the Ukraine and by Ukrainian communities elsewhere. Museums and memorials are now being built to, devoted to its memory. There are widespread claims, including by Viktor Yushchenko, president of the Ukraine at the time of the 2006 law, that the total of deaths reached 10 million, thus considerably exceeding the number of Jews killed in the Holocaust. In 2003, 25 countries at the United Nations, including Russia and the USA, issued a statement noting the 70th anniversary of the famine and putting the number of victims at between 7 and 10 million. Ukrainian groups have campaigned in Canada to have the Holodomor given equal status to the Holocaust in the new Museum of Human Rights. The Ukrainian-Canadian Civil Rights Association sent out a postcard with a picture of a pig taken from Orwell's animal farm with the words, all galleries are equal, but some galleries are more equal than others, referring to the Holocaust uh, gallery in the, in the museum and the uh, absence of a Holodomor gallery. The implication that supporters of the Holocaust gallery in the Museum of Human Rights are pigs was, I think, intended to be particularly offensive to those Jews who featured amongst the gallery supporters. Critics of the Ukrainian Civil Rights Association, Canadian Civil Rights Association pointed out that uh, the UCCA failed to mention either the role of Ukrainian nationalists in providing auxiliaries and helpers in the Holocaust and in death camps such as Treblinka, or the fact that 9,000 Ukrainian SS men emigrated to Canada at the end of the Second World War. Uh, quite possibly affecting the way uh, that these issues have been handled. Well, the figure of 7 to 10 million deaths is clearly intended to uh, rank the Holodomor above the Holocaust. Is it plausible? Robert Conquest, who nobody could accuse of being soft on communism, in his pioneering book, Harvest of Sorrow, the first to bring the famine to general attention, put the number at 5 million dead. Demographic historians such as Stephen Wheatcroft estimate deaths at 3 million. Recently opened Soviet archives record a death toll of 1.8 million from famine, but in addition, 1.2 million deaths from typhus, a disease spread by the human body louse and common in poor, unhygienic, and overcrowded situations. 
There were, incidentally, uh, many comparable deaths from typhus in Nazi concentration camps during the war. And of course, malnutrition makes it um, more difficult for people to resist such epidemics. Well, finding a reliable figure is, of course, extremely difficult. But the figure of three million seems uh, roughly uh, the most plausible. Were these deaths deliberately inflicted by Stalin? Is it just a famine caused by harvest failure? Well, in fact, there's plenty of evidence to show that although the harvests of the early 1930s were not particularly bad and could, under normal conditions, have fed the population, the Soviet authorities seized the grain from the farmers, they refused to provide food aid to the starving uh, people, they banned people from leaving affected areas, they even deported some to places where they knew there was no food. So the famine, I think it's uh, reasonable to suggest, was man-made, not natural. Was it genocide? Around 80% of the victims were Ukrainian. But the famine has to be seen against the background, not of Russian racism, but of Stalin's policy of forced industrialization, in which he seized food from the countryside to give it to the new industrial towns, which were growing at an amazingly fast rate in the early 30s forcibly reorganized agriculture into collective farms to centralize production, achieve economies of scale, and not least ease the collection and requisitioning of food. So much was taken, in fact, that there wasn't even enough to feed the livestock. Farmers who resisted were shot or deported in large numbers as supposed kulaks, allegedly capitalist market-oriented peasants and enemies of the revolution. A considerable number showed their resistance by destroying their crops and killing their livestock. Knowing that crops would be requisitioned, peasants didn't bother to sow for the coming season. Why should they? Stalin ascribed this resistance not only to capitalist kulaks, but also to Ukrainian nationalism. The Ukrainian Communist Party was purged. In 1933, a campaign of cultural Russification was launched, uh, not least in response to the Nazi dictatorship's creation in Germany the same year, since German militarism had encouraged Ukrainian nationalism in the First World War. Stalin feared a repetition. But these measures actually coincided with the scaling down of requisitioning and arrests and the mounting, finally, rather too late, of famine relief by the Soviet regime. Famine had, in essence, by that time, achieved its major objective, breaking the will of independent peasants. By 1936, more than 90% of peasant households in the Ukraine were collectivized. A quarter of a million collective farms had replaced 25 million small private ones. This secured the supply of food to the industrial towns, into which no fewer than 25 million people moved between 1926 and 1939. So in the end, therefore, the famine, while undoubtedly, I think, deliberately created, did not target Ukrainians because they were Ukrainians, nor did it attempt to kill them all without exception. And if there were 80% of those who died in famines and from collectivization and shootings and uh, forcible um, collectivization and so on, were Ukrainian, 20% were not. What Nazi mass murder was motivated by was, from the very beginning, a racist ideology that targeted its victims by their ethnicity. These groups included not only Jews, but also Slavs. In the German-occupied western part of Poland, from September 1939 onwards, racial criteria were fundamental in framing Nazi policy. So although Polish and Jewish property was confiscated without recompense, it was not nationalized as it was in the eastern part. Instead, it was redistributed to German owners within a continuing capitalist economic system. Only the western parts of the Polish Republic were incorporated into the German Reich the Poles and Jews who lived there were driven into the areas reserved for them, the so-called general government run by the Nazi jurist Hans Frank. In the long run, the general government too was intended to be Germanized, and here too, the authorities started to drive out and dispossess Poles, uh, putting Jews into ghettos, uh, bringing in ethnic German settlers to start up German farming and small town communities. More than a million Polish forced laborers were deported to Germany for economic reasons rather than political ones uh, to meet a labor shortage uh, already uh, created by the drafting of workers to the front. Well, these population transfers, I think, can only be understood fully as can those carried out in occupied uh, Soviet territory uh, after June 1941 in a wider context. The Nazi 
Population transfers belong in the context of the far-reaching plans of the Nazi regime with the ethnic reordering of Eastern Europe, indeed ultimately the whole of Europe, developed above all by SS chief Heinrich Himmler and his capacity as Reich Commissioner for the Strengthening of the German Race, one of many grand titles which he accumulated. <coughs> Half a million ethnic Germans from East Poland, Romania, the Soviet Union and other parts of Eastern Europe were brought into German-occupied Poland as settlers under the Nazi-Soviet Pact they were allowed to leave, and if you were um, an ethnic German or probably anybody else in Stalin's Soviet Union, uh, it wasn't a bad idea to, to leave if you were going to somebody where you, somewhere where you'd be welcome. These half a million took the place of roughly the same number of dispossessed Polish farmers. And the process is more complicated, but um, that's the essence of it, uh, uh, kicking out the Poles and Jews and bringing in uh, German settlers. And it had been going on for some months when the SS and its planning experts began in 1940 to develop the so-called general plan for the East, which uh, became official German government policy in 1942. And in its final form, this envisaged that up to 85%, and this is all written down, 85% of the Polish population, 64% of the Ukrainian, and 75% of the Belarusian would die of hunger and disease, deliberately deprived of medication and food. Between 30 and 45 million Slavs in these areas and Russia itself would perish, according to the plan, within a few years. The area they lived in would be settled by millions of German farmers. The eastern boundary of the German Reich would be extended by 1,000 kilometers to the east. New German towns would be founded in place of the old, decaying uh, Slavic towns, linked by fast rail links and autobahns. If this plan had become reality, it would have been the greatest genocide in history. As it was, a start was made when three and a third million prisoners of war from the Red Army were killed, mostly by deliberately letting them starve to death, along with the millions more Soviet citizens, a million alone in the city of St. Petersburg, known uh, by the Soviets as Leningrad, where the Germans set up a blockade that lasted for the best part of three years, deliberately avoiding the expense in men and material that a full-scale invasion of the city would have caused them. The general plan for the East owed its existence to Hitler's long-harboured ambition to create German living space, or Lebensraum, in the East of Europe. This is intended not least to avoid the fate of Germany in the First World War, when some 600,000 Germans had died of hunger and associated illnesses because of the Allied blockade and the inability of German agriculture to feed the German population without importing food. It was indeed a close connection between this general planning for a German era of domination and settlements in Eastern Europe, and the more specific so-called hunger plan that was discussed in May 1941 at a meeting between representatives of the armed forces, a variety of government ministries. According to the minutes of this meeting, umpteen million, zig millionen, people in the occupied Eastern territories would have to die of hunger if the German troops in the field and the civilians at home were to remain well fed. Now, the extermination of European Jews by the Nazi regime has to be seen, at least in part, I think, in the context of this agenda of racial reordering and, and, and genocide. But at the same time, I also believe it would be wrong to reduce it to just one more facet of this larger process, as some historians have tried to do. The Jews in Poland and Eastern Europe in general were overwhelmingly poor, with little property and few assets, mostly lived in towns, the economic advantages that their arrest, incarceration in ghettos and finally murder brought to the German Reich uh, was small. And the same goes for the Jews in the rest of Europe too. The idea that uh, it was an economic desire to keep the uh, German population at a high standard of living uh, was behind the Holocaust is, I think, untenable. The landed estates and properties intended for occupation by German settlers were almost exclusively owned by non-Jews. Millions of people whom the general plan for the East envisaged murdering or allowing to perish from hunger or disease included Jews, but the overwhelming majority were Slavs. Representatives of the German armed forces and bureaucrats in the agriculture ministry did in fact justify the killing of Jews on the grounds that they consumed food without producing for the war economy and with us to quote a commonly used phrase in the Nazi bureaucracy, useless eaters where Jews could be put to work for the German war economy, as in the Wurch ghetto, they were allowed for a time to live on. 
but here the conditions under which they were forced to work, were deliberately made so poor that another phrase entered common bureaucratic parlance in the Nazi, uh, Nazi uh, occupying forces at the same time, extermination through labor, Vernichtung durch Arbeit. Justifications for their mass murder in terms of the food supply situation <coughs> or the economic interests of the Reich did not, in my view, in the end, reflect the central reason for the killing of Jews, even though it's possible that the extermination program was accelerated in the late spring and early summer of 1942 because of a crisis in the food supply for Germany and its occupying forces. Even if this is the case, it still needs to be explained why the Nazis always put the Jews of Eastern Europe at the bottom of the heap when drawing up quotas for rationing rules and regulations for work and much else besides, below the Russians, below the Czechs, below the Ukrainians, below the Poles, even below the Gypsies. And here we come to the central point. Nazi propaganda and ideology regarded and portrayed Jewry, Judentum, the collective term for Jews, in quite different terms from those in which they represented Slavdom, Slavantum. Slavs, Poles, Czechs, Russians, Ukrainians, and so on, were subhumans who were portrayed as primitive, backward, passive, and stupid, posing no threat to Germany, unless they were led by clever and ruthless Jews. In themselves, in this ideology, Slavs were dispensable, but they did not challenge the very existence of Germany and the German race. Even in the final phase of the war, when Nazi propaganda concentrated on whipping up fear among ordinary Germans of the Bolshevik threat, it consistently portrayed Bolshevism and Stalinism as tools of an international Jewish conspiracy. In the end, Slavs were a regional obstacle <coughs> to the extension of the German Empire in Europe. Jews were a worldwide threat to the very existence of the Germans. The Jew, and Goebbels' his propaganda machine never tired of claiming, was unlike the Russian or the Pole, nothing less than the world enemy, the Weltfeind. Here is another area as Nazi propagandists and ideologues drew on the experience of the First World War, or rather on their paranoid understanding of Germany's defeat. This was the infamous stab in the back legend, according to which Jews in Germany in 1918 had, experienced, had exploited popular dissatisfaction with the miserable conditions under which Germans had to live, with starvation and disease rampant, and food shortages at unbearable levels, in order to foment a socialist revolution at home, which then overthrew the hitherto undefeated armed forces from within. In fact, of course, the majority of German Jews were not revolutionaries at all, but nationalist liberals or conservatives, well integrated into German society, fully behind the war effort. Many of the men served in the German forces in the First World War, and the German army was defeated at the front in battle in the summer, late summer of uh, 1918, as David Stevenson has recently shown. Still, between <coughs> January <coughs> 1933 and September 1939, Germans were constantly bombarded with anti-Semitic propaganda from every organ of the Nazi-controlled media. While the regime inexorably drove out the Jews from German economy society through a long series of discriminatory laws and regulations and dispossessions and violent assaults. The aim was to prepare Germany for a new European war by reducing, and as far as possible, uh, as far as possible the um, supposed potential Jewish threat from within, avoiding a repeat of the stab in the back. Roughly half the small Jewish population of Germany, less than 1% of the population, left the country by the time the war began. With the invasion of Poland, German soldiers for the first time came face to face with a poor and downtrodden Jewish population on a large scale. Two and a half million Jews lived in Poland, almost all of them practicing the, the Jewish religion, speaking Yiddish, dressed, dressing quite differently from their Polish neighbors. German soldiers and officials German ethnic militias and above all members of the SS task forces sent into Poland to provide what was called euphemistically security, maltreated Poles, arrested them, dispossessed them, attacked them, deported them in unheated cattle trucks, put them into camps, beat them to death, shot them, and in general treated them as less than human, as they did the inhabitants of other parts of Eastern Europe that they conquered later on from June 1941. By their behavior towards the Jews, they encountered had an extra sadistic edge. Soldiers stopped Jews in the street, 
pulled their beards out or set light to them, forced them to smear each other with excrement, assembled them in public squares and made them perform gymnastic exercises at gunpoint for hour after hour until they dropped from exhaustion. They compelled Jewish girls to clean public toilets with their blouses. They subjected all of them to ritual humiliation and sadistic public degradation in a way that they did not with Poles and other Slavs. Now, this uh, sadistic behaviour towards Jews, or a, a kind of sadistic behaviour towards Jews, was also apparent in the two other European states which participated in the genocide, largely or not entirely, if not entirely on their own, uh, though it's unlikely they would have done so without the war and the victories of, of, of Germany and the Eastern Front initially. That's to say Croatia and Romania. Up to 380,000 Jews were killed by Romanian forces during the war. In circumstances that even the SS units in the era described disapprovingly as sadistic. Large numbers, for example, were deliberately penned into enclosures on a state pig farm. While the Romanian fascists, the Iron Guard, put other Jews through all the stages of killing in a state slaughterhouse, ending by hanging their corpses from meat hooks. In the German puppet state of Croatia, 30,000 Jews out of a total population of 45,000 Jews were killed by the Ostasha militia acting under government orders. Many were beaten to death with hammers and iron bars or put in concentration camps where they were deliberately infected with diseases and left to perish from malnutrition. In Croatia, Catholic priests, especially Franciscan friars, urged the militia on to kill the infidels. While in Romania, the head of state, Marshal Ion Antonescu, justified the killings by calling the Jews the creatures uh, of Satan. There is uh, a uh, very strong, indeed dominant element of religious anti-Semitism in these two states. Although there are elements of um, racist anti-Semitism in some of uh, uh, Antonescu's propaganda, what makes them distinctive is that they're given a religious tinge. And uh, the, the kind of um, sadism meted out to the Jews in these uh, areas was fundamentally uh, religious in nature. It wasn't the kind, similar kind of sadism that you find in Nazi occupying forces, which is not driven by religious but by racial motives. And uh, Antonescu uh, proclaimed the need for, uh, to get rid of the Jews from Romania in order to achieve the cleansing of society. For him, the Jews were a local or at most a regional problem, not the world enemy. So he expelled, for example, many thousands of Jews across the border to Ukraine just to get rid of them. It was not the purpose of Antonescu's regime to pursue and destroy Jews wherever they were found. And similarly in Croatia, it's the aim of the fascist Ustasha regime to purify the country of minorities, leaving the Croats in sole occupation. Three, uh, 300,000 Orthodox Christian Serbs and many thousands of gypsies, in Romania too, were murdered alongside the Jews. So genocide is directed fundamentally inwards here. Neither regime went so far as to claim that there was a world conspiracy of Jews whose fundamental aim was to destroy either Croatia or Romania. In the final analysis, both anti-Semitism, it seems to me, were aspects of a wider-ranging, virulent and extreme form of authoritarian religiously driven populist nationalism in which minorities, particularly religious, also ethnic, linguistic, had to be destroyed. For the Nazis, by the contrast, the extermination of the Jews possessed a central importance. It was closely connected with the boundless war aims of the Third Reich. Hitler believed it was only through the universal destruction of the world enemy, the Jews, that Germany could gain mastery of Europe in the long run, the entire world. Romania and Croatia were, of course, only regional powers in no position to launch a, world, a, world, a, a war for the domination of Europe. And um, quite a part, of the, uh, um, uh, a part of the uniqueness of the Nazi genocide of the Jews derived from the fact that Germany had been a rising world power before the First World War, which went through so deep and comprehensive a crisis in its society, economy, politics and culture as a result of its defeat in 1918 that a significant number of Germans believed the only answer to the question of how Germany could rise again to become a world power was an apocalyptic one. An extreme crisis demanded extreme measures. These people, of course, were a minority, but in 1933 they came to power. By 1939, they were putting their ideas into effect. So the 
reductionist attempts of some historians recently to portray what the Nazis called the final solution of the Jewish question in Europe in terms of war-related economic rationality cannot, I believe, encompass the depth and breadth of Nazi anti-Semitism. Not only were Jews dispossessed, arrested, deported to extermination camps in Eastern Europe from countries like France, Belgium, Holland, Norway, Italy, at least in the intention, Denmark, <coughs> Uh, when they were occupied by Nazi Germany. <clears throat> Hitler pressed his allies, such as Hungary, to deliver up their Jewish pop uh, population for extermination. And when they resisted, uh, he invaded and, and uh, ordered it anyway. And Heinrich Himmler, head of the SS, even went personally to Finland, specifically in order to ask the government, an ally of Germany, to surrender its tiny and completely insignificant Jewish community to be taken to Auschwitz and killed. The minutes of the Wannsee Conference, held early in 1942, to coordinate measures for the killing of European Jews, also listed other relatively insignificant, numerically insignificant Jewish communities in countries yet to be conquered by Germany, including Ireland, for ex eventual extermination as well. Now this obsessiveness, this desire to be comprehensive, make no exceptions, is a major feature uh, distinguishing the Nazis' racial war from all other racial wars in history. Of course, there have been many racial conflicts in Europe and other parts of the world, both before and after the Second World War. Some of them are rightly being called genocidal. One war in particular has been singled out uh, by historians as providing a precedent, perhaps an impulse, for the Holocaust. The German extermination of the Herreros in the German colony of Southwest Africa, now Namibia, in 1905-06. Following a rebellion by the Herreros against German settlers who were appropriating their land, a German military force arrived with the officially proclaimed intention of exterminating the tribe, uh, whose that was, the word extermination was used in the, the official war uh, documents. Uh, their people were shot, driven into concentration camps, and labelled officially as concentration camps by the Germans, uh, or driven into the desert to starve. 65,000 out of 80,000 Herreros died. It's difficult, however, I think, to sustain the argument that this genocidal war inspired the Holocaust. The personal continuities between the Germans involved in it and those who became Nazis after the First World War were few. And above all, of course, the Herreros were regarded by the Germans as inferior beings, to be swept away to make room for German settlers. If there was a parallel with Nazi racial policy, it was a, a parallel, parallel with Nazi policy towards the Slavs, not towards the Jews. In this sense, you can say the German racial war in Eastern Europe from 1939, and particularly from 1941 to 45, was also a colonial war. Hitler indeed often drew parallels in his lunch and dinner time monologues between the annihilation of billions of Slavs envisaging the general plan for the East and the annihilation of the indigenous population by European settlers in Australia or North America. Extermination of the Jews, however, can't be understood, I think, in this way. And of course, in Australia and North America, there was no central plan driving the extermination. It was above all the introduction of European diseases, which uh, um, killed off the majority of the native population. For Hitler, the Second World War was from the very outset a racial war. As he emphasized already in August 1939, before it began, in conversation with leading representatives of the armed forces. He regarded the eugenic improvement of the German race as an integral part of this war, <coughs> just as he did the removal of the Jews from Germany in the longer run from Europe. It's significant that when he signed the order to begin the long-planned mass killing of the mentally ill and handicapped Germans in Germany in October 1939, he backdated the order to the 1st of September, the first day of the war, saying, in other words, that this program of killing the mentally ill and handicapped was linked to the war. Uh, beginning on its first day. More significant still was the fact that when, as he did on many occasions during the war, he recalled the pre-war prophecy he'd made uh, in uh, January 1939 that if intentional finance, if, if international, I'm quoting here, if international finance jury within Europe and without should succeed in precipitating the peoples once more into a world war, the result will be not the Bolshevization of the earth and with it the victory of Jewry, but the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe. And when he, as he often did during the war, recalled this prophecy, he dated it incorrectly, not to the 30th of January 1939, the anniversary of his appointment as Reich Chancellor when he'd made the prophecy, 
but to the 1st of September 1939 when the war began. For Hitler, in other words, the introduction of radical measures for the racial renewal of Germany, Europe and the world all began on the same day with the launching of the war. Now, a key aspect of waging war for the Nazis was the strengthening of a so-called Aryan race, basically the Germans with a few possible others, in Northern Europe, and the elimination not only of the mentally ill and handicapped, but also of asocials, so-called, and criminals, and everyone who's classified as alien to the national community, or Gemeinschaftsfremd, as they put it. The overwhelming majority of the 16,000 or so death sentences carried out during the Third Reich were carried out during the war. From September 1942 onwards, some 20,000 state prison inmates incarcerated as repeat petty offenders under provisions made earlier for security confinement. There's often people who had three convictions or four convictions of steam bicycles, petty fences like that. These people were taken from the prisons and sent to the concentration camp at Mauthausen, where they were subjected to annihilation through labour. More than a third of them were dead by the end of the war. So Nazi ideology classified criminality and deviance as hereditarily determined. So even minor offenders threatened to cause racial degeneracy if they're left alive. And this belief extended to Germany's and Europe's gypsies as well, who were arrested in large numbers, taken to, to the camps and sent to the gas chambers of Auschwitz in their thousands. But it's significant that the classification system applied to camp inmates by the SS classified the gypsies as asocial. They had to wear the black triangle reserved mainly for vagrants, tramps, al alcoholics, and other deviants from Nazi behavioral norms. More than 20,000 gypsies died in Auschwitz, three quarters from sickness and malnutrition. The SS task forces killed many thousands in various parts of Eastern Europe. The German army shot many more in Serbia. The Croatian and Romanian authorities placed large numbers in camps or shot them too. But in all these cases, gypsies are regarded primarily as a social, social deviant, or as in Serbia, tools of the Jews in partisan movements. And the killing of the gypsies was less systematic than that of the Jews. Many survived, particularly if they worked in war-related industries. Between 5,000 and 15,000 remained in Germany at the end of the war, though 2,500 of these were forcibly sterilized. Killing gypsies was an urgent, was a, an urgent task the Nazis set themselves in order to win the war. Even more urgent was the annihilation of the Jews. Immediately after the invasion of the Soviet Union, on the 22nd of June 1941, Hitler, Goebbels, and the entire Nazi propaganda apparatus unfolded an intensive anti-Semitic campaign that portrayed Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin uh, as tools of international Jewry engaged in a world conspiracy, fantastic though the idea was, to destroy the German race. And Stalin himself, of course, was notoriously anti-Semitic. Lasting to the end of the year, this propaganda offensive created a genocidal climate in which Nazis at many different levels of the hierarchy, particularly in the SS, encouraged personally by Himmler and his deputy Heydrich, competed with one another in the mass murder of Eastern Europe's Jews. At the same time, however, it was also clear that what Hitler called the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe in his so-called prophecy was to be a pan-European program of murder. Already in September 1941, the Reich Security Head Office, Himmler's headquarters, realized it couldn't be achieved by mass shootings of the kind already being carried out by SS task forces behind the Eastern Front. The technical aspects of the so-called Action T4, named after Tiergartenstrasse 4, Hitler's own personal office where it, which, which ran it, uh, the gassing of thousands of mental hospital inmates and others uh, regarded as mentally deficient or ill, these officers were now available for practical advice since the first phase of Action T4, in which 70,000 mentally ill and handicapped Germans had been murdered, was brought to an end in August by the public protests of the Bishop of Münster. And the government, uh, the Nazis basically didn't think they could afford to offend the Catholic Church while the war was on. So they didn't arrest him and they stopped. Wrong, I think it'd be wrong to see a causal link, as some have done. If the T4 action had continued in the gas chambers of German mental hospitals, instead of what now happened, namely its continuation in a less conspicuous way by lethal injections and the starvation of patients, this would, in my view, not have prevented the use of mass gassing in the murder of Jews. By the end of December 1941, all four SS task forces behind the Eastern Front possessed a mobile gas chamber. 
in which Jewish men, women and children were murdered by carbon monoxide exhaust fumes piped into a sealed chamber at the back of the lorry. In March, May and July 1942, respectively, the three extermination camps of the so-called Reinhardt Action, under construction, of course, for several months previously, began the mass extermination of Jews, of Nazi Jewish inhabitants of Nazi-created ghettos in Warsaw Woods and other Polish cities through the pumping of exhaust gases from motors into sealed rooms. From March 1942, the largest extermination camps at Auschwitz-Birkenau also came into operation using the cyanide-based disinfectant gas to Clon B to kill over a total of over a million Jews, not just from the East, but from Western and Southern Europe too. <coughs> now, poison gas had already been used in international conflicts as a weapon of war by both sides in the First World War, and indeed the majority of the projectiles launched by the Germans in their great offensive, the Spring Offensive of 1918, were gas projectiles. They'd been used by the Spanish in putting down a rebellion in Spanish Morocco, and poison gas had been used by the Italians in the conquest of Ethiopia when this had been dropped, poison gas onto the Ethiopian armies from airplanes. But all of these examples involve the use of poison gas against active combatants. In Germany, as well as in England, the government's fear of gas bombing uh, on a major scale on the big cities was so great that millions of gas masks were manufactured and distributed to the population. But such raids were never carried out. Neither German nor British bombers ever carried any gas projectiles, probably because both sides feared the escalation of the conflict that this would mean. There's no parallel, therefore, to the Nazis' use of poison gas to murder non-combatant Jewish civilians. But at the same time, I don't think it would be right to reduce the uniqueness of the Holocaust simply to the mere technical factor of the use of poison gas to carry it out. And that's because the extermination camps were only one instrument of a wider program of killing using a variety of methods. By the time the war came to an end, the Nazis and their allies had murdered nearly six million Jews. 3 million died in the gas chambers. 1.3 million were shot by SS task forces, police and army units. 700,000 were murdered in mobile gas vans. And up to a million died as a result of deliberate starvation, disease and maltreatment in the camps uh, or uh, the ghettos set up in Eastern Europe by the Nazis from late 1939 onwards or in transit. It's certainly true that no other genocide in history has included among its methods the use of poison gas in specially constructed facilities. But in identifying what was unique about the Nazi genocide of the Jews in general as a whole, it's more important in my view to specify why rather than how. And its peculiar characteristics, its unique characteristics derived from the fact that the Nazis regarded the Jews of Europe, indeed the world, as I've said, as a deadly universal threat to their existence and that of Germany more generally. It had to be eliminated by any means possible, as fast as possible, and as thoroughly as possible. The mass gassing, of course, belonged undoubtedly to the modern industrial age. It con contradicted the assumption, or perhaps the hope, that technological progress would lead to the general moral improvement of human society. But it would be wrong to claim that the use of technical industrial methods implied there was something mechanical, impersonal, automatic about the Nazi murder of the Jews. It set it part, apart as a uniquely modern or modernist uh, form or industrial form of genocide. The wave of arrests in the ghettos, the conditions of life there in the transit camps, the terrible circumstances in which the victims are transported, the brutality of the police and SS men who guarded them, all this meant that the attempts of some SS officers to deceive the victims were half-hearted gestures that deceived nobody, or very few symbolized by the railway clock on the Treblinka station, intended to convey the impression that this is a transit station, a railway station where they'd be changing trains, but that can't have deceived many since the hands were painted on and never moved. The machinery of killing was uncomplicated, makeshift, and often broke down under the strain of dealing with such huge numbers of victims, even in Auschwitz. The unbridled violence meted out by the SS and camp orderlies to the victims on their way to the gas chambers can have left hardly any of the victims in any doubt about the fate that awaited them. There's nothing clinical or impersonal about the killings, nor, despite Hannah Arendt's postulate of the banality of evil, about the motivation of the men like Adolf Eichmann who organized them, not faceless bureaucrats, but fanatical anti-Semites. 
Holocaust stood at uh, the middle of a century that, alas, witnessed a variety of genocides in a variety of places. I just want to take one at the beginning and one at the end. At the beginning, in 1915, the so-called Young Turks, nationalists who'd seized power in the Ottoman Empire, following its loss of 40% of its territory during the Balkan Wars, launched a campaign of genocide against the Armenian Christian minority in Anatolia. There had already been pogroms and massacres, notably in 1894-6 and again in 1909, the scale, time the scale was much bigger, serving the interests of a pan-Turkish ideology that regarded non-Turkish minorities as agents of the enemy power, Russia, and obstacles to the revolutionary creation of a new pan-Turkish state <clears throat> that would include areas at the time controlled by other powers, notably Tsarist Russia. Armenians were deported from eastern Anatolia into the Syrian desert. Many were killed along the way. Many more died of starvation thirst uh, en route. Officially sponsored killing squads were formed to massacre Armenians, often accompanying the murders with horrifying atrocities. <clears throat> Around a million Armenians died. Between 1918 and 1923, another half a million, totaling three quarters of the entire Armenian population altogether of the Ottoman Empire. Now, like the Jews, the Armenians specialised in trade and finance, and a large proportion of them practised a different religion from that of their persecutors, Christian rather than Muslim. Like the Nazis, the Young Turks took as their aim the creation of an ethnically homogeneous state. Like the Nazis, they'd come to power in a violent revolution. Like the Nazis, they claimed the minority whose elimination they sought was the agent of a foreign power. In the German case, the World Jewish Conspiracy led from America, and the Turkish case, the Russians. Like the Nazis, the Young Turks aimed to invade other countries to create a new powerful empire. As in Germany, the genocide took place in the World War. But the parallels didn't end there. The extreme right in the Weimar Republic, including the Nazis, regarded the killing of the Armenians, to whom they referred as the Jews of Turkey, in a favourable light, rightly or wrongly seeing it as the expression of a nationalist, militarist government far stronger and more determined than the feeble democracy of the Weimar Republic, something to be translated into German politics and copied rather than criticised. But there's also very significant differences. The Armenians are geographically concentrated in eastern Anatolia, near to the Russian border, while Germany and even more Europe's Jews were not. The Young Turks didn't accuse the Armenians of fostering a subversive and degenerative spirit amongst the majority of population, as the Nazis did the Jews. The Armenians were killed overwhelmingly by deportation under murderous conditions, <clears throat> not in death camps or shooting pits, though shooting did, of course, take place on a large scale nor were they viewed as agents of a world conspiracy to undermine Turkey. So the Turks, in my view, had no intention of uh, um, uh, annihilating Armenians outside Turkey, or rather outside the larger Turkey they planned. The Jews in Germany were not, uh, as has sometimes been claimed in comparative studies, a, a, a low-status-deprived minority like the Armenians. And on the contrary, a well-established, well-acculturated group, many of whom were well-off and played a prominent role in national life and culture. By 1914, the Jewish religion was in sharp decline in Germany, with intermarriage between religious Jews and Protestants reaching around 50% of all Jewish marriages in a city like Hamburg, for example. The killing of the Armenians was not part of a wider program of ethnic reordering and eugenic cleansing such as the Nazis undertook, but again, a nationalist campaign of ethnic cleansing directed against a particular religious, social, and territorial minority. It was comparable, perhaps, to later genocidal massacres of Jews and gypsies in Romania, or uh, Jews, Gypsies, and Serbs in Croatia. At the other end of the century, 1994, following a brief ethnic civil war at the beginning of the decade that ended in a fragile peace brokered internationally, the majority Hutu inhabitants of the African country of Rwanda mobilized to murder all the members of the Tutsi minority they could find with machetes, guns, grenades, and clubs in a face-to-face -face orgy of homicidal violence. Rwanda, before the First World War, had been a German colony, part of a German colony, and um, it has been argued with some plausibility that German ethnographers descended upon the area with ethnographic maps and criteria and imposed upon a loose, uh, loose social differences, uh, racial classifications, uh, which hardened into what's become known as an ethnogenesis. Uh, so it goes back a long way, but by this time there was a high degree of hatred between the two groups. Hutu ideologues claimed the Tutsi were interlopers who'd enslaved them for centuries, pastoralists who did not belong in a settled agricultural society. Radio broadcasts during the violence even urged Hutus, quote, to exterminate the Tutsi from the globe, 
and to invade neighboring countries to do so. And in a few weeks, seven out of every 10 Tutsis were brutally murdered with a death toll reaching 800,000. Yet, for all its genocidal ideology and ambition, this too was a regionally limited action. It made the Holocaust unique was among other things, in my view, the fact that it was geographically and temporarily unlimited. Nazi vision of the future envisaged a world of endless and continuing struggle for its own sake, where one triumph would just lead on to another greater conflict. Hitler's ultimate vision of a global conflict between a German run Europe and the United States was already foreshadowed in his unpublished second book of 1928. He regarded from early on the Jews of America <clears throat> as Germany's implacable enemy, warning them, as he saw it, through the 1st of April 1933 boycott of Jewish shops in Germany, then through his speech of 30 January 1939 and his subsequent references to it. The Nazi conquest of Europe would most likely have been the springboard for a war with America in which a Nazi victory would have led to the extermination of America's Jews as well. There's never any chance of this happening. The status of world Jewry, Welt Judentum in Nazi ideology, had no parallel, say, in young Turkish concepts of the Armenians or Hutu concepts of the Tutsi. The Holocaust was one genocide among many. Every genocide was different. Extermination of the Native Americans, Australian or Australian uh, uh, Aborigines was no less a genocidal uh, because it was achieved mainly by disease. Ideology, I think, is crucial here. Uh, the death marches from the Nazi camps in the advance of the advancing Red Army, uh, they, the camps were evacuated from the east towards the middle of Germany as the Red Army came close in 1944 to 5, along with the terrible final phase of the camps' existence, as camps like Belsen were overcrowded with tens of thousands of uh, new inmates, sick and, and ill, uh, being brought in from other camps. All of this killed over half of the 715,000 prisoners held in the camps at the beginning of 1945. The vast majority of these prisoners were not Jewish. But that doesn't mean the death marches were not genocidal. Daniel Blackman has argued very um, persuasively, I think, <coughs> the SS regarded all of them as racially inferior and shot burned or starved them to death or let them perish from disease. Because the Nazis, remember, regarded criminality as a sign of some kind of racial inferiority and they believed that all these people were in the camps because, <clears throat> because they were, in a variety of senses, racially inferior. And that contrasted strongly with the tens of thousands of British and other prisoners of war evacuated from their camps at the same time who were not subjected to such murderous treatment. If the Holocaust was one genocide among many, it had features that made it stand out from the rest as well. Unlike all the others, it was not bounded by space or time. Unlike all the others, it was not launched against a local or regional obstacle, but as a world enemy seen as operating on a global scale. It was bound to an even larger plan of racial reordering and reconstruction involving, involving further genocidal killing on an almost unimaginable scale. But that was aimed, however, at clearing a particular region, Eastern Europe for a further struggle against the Jews and those the Nazis regarded as the Jewish puppets. It was set in motion by ideologues, Nazi ideologues who saw the whole of world history in racial terms. All of these things, I think, made it unique. But the uniqueness of the Holocaust in this sense, finally, doesn't mean we can't learn from it, although I think we've signally failed to do so since 1945, at least until very recently. We can look at extreme nationalist and racist ideologies and see from the experience of the Holocaust when they look like spilling over into genocide and mass murder. We can, I think, intervene at this point to stop them going any further. The international criminal jurisdiction created at Nuremberg was not created to deal with the Holocaust, but established principles uh, upon which the world has been able to build uh, um, a more effective international criminal jurisdiction, particularly an in international criminal court at The Hague, founded only very recently in this century. And as it becomes stronger, it can pose an increasingly powerful obstacle to outbreaks of genocidal violence, especially when they're state-sponsored across the world. Human societies have a continuing ability, it seems, to generate ethnic hatreds. But the means to stop these escalating into genocide have become more effective in the 21st century, above all, I believe, because of the recovery of the cultural memory of the Holocaust in the final decade of the 20th. Thank you very much. <laughs>